Shall we get started? Cool. I guess we have fewer people today. Normally we have more. What happened? Is there is there a break or something that I don't know of? Not not that you know of also, I guess. <laughs> Maybe they have some break in their minds. Okay. So did you all enjoy the lectures last week on memory? Yeah, you, you got exposed to some really cutting edge research in memory basically. Memory latency, errors, and also you've seen some examples of accelerating some important workloads like machine learning and sparse matrix calculations. So if you haven't if you didn't attend, please review the lectures. Uh, there's an exam coming up next week if you didn't know. Last week's lectures are also part of the exam, anything we've covered, including today. And then there will be a review session tomorrow. So please come to the review session. If you solve the questions already, you will learn a lot more from the review session. You will benefit a lot more. Homework questions, of course, right? <laughs> okay, so today we're going to cover memory controllers, which is what we were talking about, but we never really went into uh, the scheduling aspects of memory controllers. That's what we're going to do today. Does that sound good? Okay, so let's jump into it. Uh, and your assignment, actually, your third lab is out already, which is on memory, memory scheduling. Hopefully you'll have some fun with it. This time you're going to move to a different infrastructure. You're going to use the Ramulator infrastructure, which is uh, this, the DRAM simulator that we talked about when we talked about simulation, which we developed, which is being used across academia and industry. So you'll get exposed to some state-of-the-art simulator as opposed to building your own simulator, which you did in labs one and two. Now you're going to take some other simulator and extend it with memory scheduling policies. Two known memory scheduling policies, which we're going to hopefully get to. And, two, and you'll also have freedom to create your own memory scheduling policy, which will hopefully outperform the previous ones, right? So you'll have a, a flexibility to create. And this is, a, this is a very good area to innovate on, as you will see in a little bit. OK. So let's jump into this. Memory controllers. Well, you know what these are, actually. These are uh, hardware structures that control memory in the end. But uh, even though we're going to talk a lot about DRAM, uh, other types of memories also need memory controllers. Actually, any memory needs a controller in the end. And especially long latency memories have similar characteristics that need to be controlled. Uh, and the following discussion in this lecture, and maybe in the next lecture also, you will use DRAM as an example, but many scheduling and control issues are really similar in other types of memories. For example, flash memory. Uh, if you have time, we will talk about flash memory uh, later in the lectures. Other emerging memory technologies like phase change memory, STTM RAM, we will definitely have a lecture on emerging memory technologies after the exam week. Uh, and we're going to talk about these. And you will see that they, they also require similar uh, scheduling mechanisms. And also, in, in addition to DRAM, these memories are actually more complex because they place other demands on the controller. It turns out errors are a big problem in all of these memory technologies, even bigger than DRAM. Even though you know that DRAM has a lot of errors today, like Rovehammer, these memories also have a lot more errors and a lot, different, a lot more different failure mechanisms. For example, flash memory has a wear out problem. If you keep writing to a cell, after some number of writes, you cannot write to or read from the cell. Basically, the cell becomes non-operational. That's called wear out. And the memory controller manages to ensure that cells wear out evenly so that there is no part of memory that wears out earlier than the other part. That's called wear, wear leveling or wear out leveling to be more uh, precise. And memory controller is responsible for managing that. You could also have operating system managing that also th think about in your in your mind, but how do you do that is a, g a good question. Though that exists in phase change memory also. Phase change memory, as you know, as we discussed, is already out there. Intel has their persistent memory technology. And uh, memory controllers do very leveling in phase change memory as well. So before we move into uh, DRAM, I'd like to very quickly give you an overview of the more complicated memory controllers, if you will. This is an example of an SSD controller. These are, in a sense, very similar to memory controllers, except they're much more complex. <laughs> they have to deal with a lot more stuff. And they're clearly specific to something else, some other type of memory, flash memory. And flash memory has uh, basically a lot more needs, if you will. Uh, so these controllers, for example, uh, essentially they, ha they have some processors. They have some parts that are general purpose processors. They also have some parts that are really hardware and firmware, basically, uh, because they need to do the decisions very quickly. For example, a lot of the ECC engines are implemented in hardware in there. Uh, 
So they need to do a very complex error correction. So they, they may need to correct, for example, 40 bits or so across 8,000 bits because there are a lot of errors that you see in these memories. They do error leveling as we discussed. They do voltage optimization because whenever you do a read, you need to have a reference voltage. And how you select that reference voltage determines your error rate significantly. If you pick a wrong reference voltage, you may actually incorrectly read the data as we will see later on also. They do other things like page remapping uh, so to, en to enable vary leveling. Also, they, they, uh, because of the characteristics of the memory, uh, some things are very different. For example, in DRM, reads and writes are symmetrical. Right? We have we never thought about reads and writes differently. As you, uh, but, but in flash memory, if you want to uh, write to a page, you first need to erase the entire page. And that erase operation actually takes a very long time, at least an order of magnitude longer than a read operation. Which means that these erases need to be carefully scheduled. And uh, you, do, you don't want to do, whenever you want to write to a page basically, you don't want to erase the page at that point in time. You really want to have a pool of erased pages, for example, uh, that you write to at that point in time. So that's, uh, th that, that leads to issues like garbage collection, for example. When do you actually decide that a page should be erased? And when do you actually uh, invalidate the pages over there? And then you need to remap the pages. So we will talk about that later on. Uh, I just wanted to give you an overall idea. But if you're interested, I, I'll recommend some papers. Okay, there's also actually, this, this doesn't show it nicely. I'll go to the next picture. Uh, if you look at a flash memory controller, there's DRAM in it. <laughs> Why? Because flash memory uh, is, these are flash memory chips. Uh, it's very slow, comparatively. So the memory controller incorporates some DRAM into it, which means that it has to have a DRAM controller also inside there. Incorporates some DRAM in it to manage the data internally. So this DRAM can, do, can, be, can serve as a cache to flash memory. It can serve as a write buffer also. Remember that whenever we write to a flash memory cell, we're degrading its reliability. That's a wear out problem. So why don't you write to DRAM first and not to write to the flash chip and consolidate many writes to the same page. That means that you're going to reduce the number of writes that you do to the flash chips, which means that you'll increase the lifetime of the flash chips. So you're basically using the DRAM uh, itself, well, DRM itself over here, uh, as a write buffer to maximize the lifetime of the SSD, which you're really controlling in the end. So as you can see, this is a very complicated controller that doesn't have only a flash controller, but also has a DRM controller. And there are a lot of other mechanisms that are employed today. Uh, clearly, we talked about the ECC engine. We, there, there are scramblers that try to uh, maximize reliability again. Uh, there's also compression employed in some SSDs. There's encryption also employed. And this, this paper, if you're really interested, uh, gives a very good overview of that. But we will hopefully have a separate sec uh, lecture on SSDs, uh, and then we'll cover these more. But this gives you an idea that actually DRAM exists everywhere. <laughs> DRAM is so ubiquitous today. Okay, so if you're interested, uh, I'd recommend this paper that we wrote. Uh, actually, it's a couple of years now, but there's, a, there's an updated version that I'm going to reference. Uh, also, this gives you a very good overview of how an SSD control looks like, and then it focuses on especially the error mechanisms. Uh, we talked a lot about memory errors, flash errors are uh, even more. And this is the result of uh, the eight years of research that we've done in, in the area of flash and SSDs. Uh, and it incorporates a lot, of other, a lot of techniques that are employed in real uh, flash controllers. And let me give you some examples. As you can see, this is a matrix over here. This is the error, different error types that you see. And these are different mitigation mechanisms that are employed uh, in existing controllers. You can see PE cycling. This is really wear out. Whenever you're programming or writing data, you actually in induce errors. Cell-to-cell -cell interference errors. Whenever you're actually uh, doing something to a cell, you're disturbing some other cells. Uh, data retention is a problem. Uh, and read disturb, similar to row hammer, is a problem also. So these are different types of error mechanisms. And you can see that there are a bunch of mitigation mechanisms which we're not going to go about, uh, go talking about right now. Voltage optimization, one of them. How do you determine the voltages? Refresh is clearly another one. Actually, flash memory controllers employ refresh, as we discussed earlier in lecture one or lecture two. Uh, that's, a, that's an important mitigation mechanism also. But you can see that not all mitigation mechanisms actually uh, fix all of the errors. Some of them are very specific. Some of them are very general, as you can see. Hot data management, for example, uh, can reduce the uh, impact of many errors because you try to move the hot data to a different location so that you uh, don't wear out some parts as much. Right? Uh, 
So it actually uh, helps a lot of the error management mechanism. If you're really interested, I would recommend looking into this paper. At some point, we may cover this in more detail. And this is the updated version of it, actually. This was, uh, even though there, there's a new update version that's coming up. <laughs> Okay, this, this covers 3D stacking also. If you remember, we talked about 3D stacking in Flash a little bit. This, uh, the difference between this one and the previous one is this, we covered 3D stacked uh, Flash memory here. There's, of course, clearly a, a lot of other stuff on SSDs, which we're not going to talk about right now, but there are simulation frameworks that you can develop that are being used also, and also things that, like scheduling mechanisms uh, that are important for Flash memory also that we're not going to talk about right now. Any questions? I find SSDs fascina fascinating also. It's a system by itself, basically. If you look at an SSD, it's pretty much a system by itself. You can do computation inside there also because you have processors inside there. Of course, the downside is, uh, well, it's a system by itself. You can use a DRAM over there to minimize the latencies as well. In a sense, it's a hybrid memory, right? You really have DRAM plus uh, flash memory. You can also incorporate some emerging memory technologies in there as well. Yes? It can, it can what? It can make use of those memories. So, for example, we have one GB of memory. I see. And we have additional some memory, and mm -hmm. when it is wear out, then it can maybe make Remap it, yes. Yes, absolutely. So, that, that's what uh, uh, th this is called over provisioning of memory. So, all, all SSD drives over provision memory, they have additional memory that they don't advertise. But so when some cells wear out, they do remapping of the worn out cells to some other locations in this memory. That's a very common technique, and that's one of the reasons why you need page remapping in flash memory. Okay, any other questions? That's increasingly being employed in DRAM also, actually. If you, uh, that, that's a very good technique in general, uh, having these additional spare rows or spare columns that you can activate dynamically. But how can it detect that these rows are wear out? Like, mm -hmm. Do they have some mechanism? Yeah, there, there are mechanisms to detect wear out. <laughs> We'll talk about that one. If you're interested, you can read the paper. <laughs> but uh, we'll talk about that when we talk about flash memory. OK. OK, so let's move to DRAM now. Basically, if, as you already know, DRAM actually has many different types. You actually have a paper that you're going to read that talks about the workload DRAM interactions. That's part of your new homework. I don't know if it's released yet, but it will be released sometime. Uh, so DRAM uh, has different types with different interfaces optimized for different purposes. Commod DRAM that we've seen DDR, low power DRAM that we've talked about, high bandwidth DRAM, this is especially for graphics, low latency DRAM types, uh, embedded DRAM is of course very costly, it's embedded into logic, but this is also very costly, reduced latency DRAM, we talked about that, 3D stack DRAM with 3D stacking, and a bunch of other things. And the key thing to uh, take away from this is underlying microarchitecture is really fundamentally the same in all of these DRAMs. What really differs is the interfaces and also the signaling mechanisms that you have at the circuit level. Uh, so a flexible memory controller ideally would support many uh, various of these DRAM types. You can write a, ver a very log code that actually supports all of these DRAM types. It'll be a lot of code, but you could do it. Uh, and this clearly complicates the memory controller. Uh, uh, and uh, as a result, most memory controllers don't do this. And as a result, it's difficult to support all types of DRAM and upgrades of the DRAM also. So you design your processor with DDR3 memory controller. Five years later, new memory technology comes out, like GDDR5, let's say. You cannot move to it because your memory controller is not designed for that interface. First of all, it's not programmable. Uh, it's, you don't have very low code for it, let's say. But even more importantly, there are analog interfaces. Uh, that are in DRAM uh, that that uh, that you need to interface the processor pins uh, and the DRAM chips with, and those interfaces are completely different in different technologies. And those are the interfaces that make the difference actually that enable very high bandwidth, for example, in GDDR5. Because remember, underlying microarchitecture is mostly fundamentally the same. They differ in terms of number of banks, as we discussed, in terms of row buffer sizes, uh, things like that maybe number of ranks in some cases, but uh, you, you get very high bandwidth because of the interface. And that analog interface is really the uh, difficult part to design if you want to have a flexible memory controller. So if, let's, say, let's assume that you want to support five of these things. Do you have five different types of analog interfaces? 
It's, a, it's actually a lot of uh, part of your chip, those analog interfaces. And it turns out they're also very, very expensive. They're, they need to be designed at high speed. Like GDDR5, for example, is, operates at extremely high speeds. Even DDR4 today actually operates at close to 3 gigahertz right now. So designing those like, interfaces actually takes a long time. So we're, not, we're clearly not talking about the analog part of it in this lecture, right? This is a computer architecture class. But keep in mind that whenever you're interfaced with an external, uh, external memory, you also have an analog portion. And in this case, uh, what really limits you to not, have, not, uh, not be able to support many different types of memories is really that analog portion. Because you could imagine having many, many memory controllers in Verilog written, right? Fine, you'll have all of them, but how do you actually interface with different chips? That becomes a bottleneck. That's why you don't see chips out there that support even two technologies. They normally support one technology, like DDR3. L this one, I believe, supports LPDDR3, for example. This one also, I think, LPDDR3, but it could also be DDR3. Okay, so this is one complexity in the design of the memory controller. How do you support multiple different technologies? If you overcome analog, then it's, it's really, you figure out how to uh, design the uh, different uh, modules. And you already, we've already seen this, this is just a picture from the emulator paper. So let's take a look at the functions of the DRAM controller. Clearly there are many functions actually. First, the, the key first function is really you need to ensure the correct operation, refresh and timing. We've already talked about both of them. On top of this, you need to uh, service DRAM requests while obeying the timing constraints. And there are many constraints. Uh, you have banks, buses, channels, uh, resource conflicts, you need to keep track of those. Uh, you have minimum delays, right, to read delays, we're going to see some of these delays. You've seen some of these delays last, in the last lectures when we talked about latency. But as we will see, there are more than 100 of these different timing parameters because of the way we designed DM to minimize the latencies as much as possible. That's the, that's the latency optimization that we have in DM today. It's not huge, but it's, it enables you to do some, uh, have some flexibility in the memory controller to optimize the latencies. And you need to translate the request to the DRAM command sequences. You need to buffer, uh, the memory controller needs to buffer and schedule requests for high performance and quality of service. This requires reordering, managing the row buffer, as we've discussed, right? How, do you, how long do you keep the row buffer open? When do you close it? You will see this actually in your lab. Uh, bank, rank, and bus management. And on, on top of this, this is all uh, correctness, performance, and then on top of that you have power and energy, right, and thermals. How do you actually ensure that you don't uh, use power unnecessarily, right? Because any power you use unnecessarily is power that you take away from computation also. So you need to be careful over here. We're not going to talk as much about this, we're going to talk a lot about this part in a little bit. So in modern DRAM controller, this is not the best picture, but it kind of looks like this basically. You get requests from different cores and I.O. devices also, and then you have some sort of arbiter, and then you decide wh which bank uh, the request goes to, for example, or, or which, uh, which channel, if you have multiple channels. And then you need to, uh, you, you queue the request buffers, and then you, you do command scheduling. And this is the analog part that I was talking about, basically. Once you schedule a command, it needs to go through this analog interface and communicate with DRAM uh, through the analog interface. And the data needs to come through that analog interface also. And these are pins that you need to drive outside the chip, so they're huge actually. That's, that's why you cannot have many of them. It's not only that they're huge, it's not the only reason that you cannot have many of them. It's also that this is a complicated thing that needs to operate at very high speed and also hopefully low power. So that actually increased the area quite a bit. Okay, this is my picture, uh, a simplified microarchitecture level picture from this paper, which we're going to hopefully talk about. Basically, you, it's, it's, it's similar. You get requests from uh, caches, and then they, go to, they, get, they get routed to different request buffers in the banks. And each bank has some independent scheduling. This is one way of designing the memory controller. Each bank has an independent scheduler. Each bank, bank selects a request that can be scheduled at a given point in time. And then there's another arbiter over here, the um, bus scheduler, that picks which bank's request needs to go out on the memory bus. Of course, in one cycle, you can schedule only one request because you have a single address and command bus that goes into the DRAM. In the next cycle, you can schedule another one. In the next cycle, you can schedule another one. Right. Okay, so we've seen some scheduling policies already. Uh, the simplest one is no scheduling, in a sense, FCFS, first come, first serve. You don't need to do any scheduling, right? You just send the request, schedule the request as they come, in the order they come. It turns out it's not very high performance, as we will see. 
uh, as a result, people have developed this policy, as we also discussed, first ready, first come, first serve. This policy prioritized robo buffer hits over other requests, and all else being equal, it prioritized all the requests over other requests. You've seen this before. And the goal here is to maximize the robo buffer hit rate, because robo buffer hits are much shorter latency than robo buffer misses or conflicts. And we've seen this, which maximizes the EM throughput, right? Which also minimizes latency. Uh, Assuming that these are the only things that affect latency, but we will see there are a bunch of other things, right? Okay, so this is uh, commonly employed. Uh, actually, scheduling is done at the command level, as you've seen last uh, last week. Uh, column commands read and write are prioritized over row commands activate and precharge. Keep this in mind. There are many memory, there are many different types of memory control designed that are designed out there, uh, and many companies do different things. Some of them, for example, what they do is they they do some scheduling at the request level. They look at the requests. And then, after they do the scheduling, they break the request uh, into the commands, and then the commands get scheduled in first come, first serve order. That's one way of doing it. You could also do scheduling at the request level. So what was the request level? Request level is just, you look at read to address X, write to address Y. Right? You don't have the commands. Right? At that point, you don't know if the request needs an activate or pre-charge or something else. Right? or it, it, reads, it needs just a read or write. You do some scheduling at the request level, and then you translate into the commands, and then you can do scheduling at the command level also. You can actually have a multi-level scheduler. I'm not going to go into the trade-offs of this, but you can imagine that there are different, this is a more finer grain scheduling. You're not scheduling requests, you're scheduling pieces of requests in this case. And each of them has advantages and disadvantages clearly. Uh, for example, a lot of IBM schedulers do uh, request level scheduling first and then they do first come, first serve at the command level, although they're complicating their schedulers also going forward. Okay, uh, I think we've already discussed this. This is basically the command level implementation of first ready, first come, first serve. Column commands are prioritized over row commands. And you have two groups now, column commands and row commands. Within each group, older commands are prioritized over younger ones. That's how you implement first, come, first ready, first come, first serve. Okay, I'm going to go through this quickly because I've shown you this before, right? This is just to jog your memory. We have this row buffer, and you know that row buffer hits are faster than row buffer conflicts. You've seen this animation, I think, multiple times before, so you can do it on your own again. Do you remember? Okay, good. Any questions while I go through this animation? We can overlap the latency of animation with your questions. Overlapping latency is a powerful thing. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, okay, uh, what's a scheduling policy? A, a scheduling policy is really essentially a prioritization order. And this prioritization can be based on many, many things. Here you can really exercise your creativity. It could be based on request age, clearly. We talked about that's first to come, first serve. Older first. Row buffer hit miss status. It could be based on request type. Is it a read or is it a write? Is it a prefetch? We're going to talk about prefetching, actually, uh, later on. Uh, you will see that... A prefetch is trying to bring the data before it's really requested by the processor. How do you order them compared to reads and writes? Right? This is type at the request level. You don't have a prefetch request command in DRAM clearly. At the request level, you have a prefetch request. Do you prioritize them over reads or writes? How do you do that prioritization? Actually, it turns out that's not a simple prioritization. There is no simple answer to this. If you prioritize, let's call these demands. These are demand requests from the processor. If you always prioritize demands over prefetches, you don't get the best performance. If you always prioritize prefetches or, uh, over demands, you don't get the best performance. Because there are some cases where it makes sense to prioritize prefetches. Because, it, for example, uh, a prefetch request comes to a row buffer that's already open. And if you actually serve that prefetch request, you could quickly get one more piece of data out of the row buffer without delaying the demand request too much. And if that prefetch request is useful, actually, you've done a good thing. Right? But of course, if that prefetch request is not very useful, you don't know this beforehand, of course, but you can predict it. Then you may not want to do that uh, prioritization of prefetch requests over demand. So uh, it's, the, the right answer over here is really being adaptive. You, know, you really want to adapt to uh, the accuracy of the prefetch requests, whether they're going to be useful. And also the status of the DRAM itself. If the prefetch request, request is causing a robot for conflict, you may want to be very careful about whether or not you're going to prioritize a prefetch request over a demand request. Does that make sense? Okay. If you're interested in this, we'll, we'll talk about that. But uh, there's a work that we've done a long time ago that's called Prefetch Aware Memory Controllers. Uh, and yeah, there are a lot of things. So requester type is another thing, right? This is at the request level again. Is it a load miss or a store miss? A load miss is a load instruction that's causing a cache miss that's out in memory. 
and load instructions clearly waiting for the data so that the processor can proceed. But store miss, store instruction may not be really waiting for the data, right? Especially if you're a write buffer and if you if you uh, if you ensure that stores don't cause a lot of problems, because store misses can be handled off the critical path as as much as you can, right? This is also important. Uh, similarly, actually, there's another thing over here, which is is it is the write back from memory? Uh, if it's a write back, then it's really not delaying the processor, right? But of course, not, not, in, not in all conditions. Request criticality, now we're, we're getting more fuzzy, right? Uh, what, how critical is this request to the progress of the processor? How do you define it, first of all? That's also another. And the people have defined, have, have had many different definitions. For example, is it the oldest miss in the core? So the core can generate, let's say, five misses. Is this the oldest one? Oldest one, uh, assuming that the oldest one is really blocking the core, right? How many instructions in the core are dependent on this request? That could be another definition of criticality, right? If you actually finish this request early, you'll enable 100 different instructions to execute, which is possible, right? Because all of those instructions may be waiting for a single piece of data. Right? So people have tried to figure out definitions of criticality quite a bit. Uh, it turns out many of the cache misses uh, whose latencies are not overlapped are actually critical from the perspective of the core. But the key question is, of course, is if its latency is overlapped, uh, how do you actually figure that out? Okay, well, it's stall the processor. That's basically the overlapping uh, example. So these are different difficult prediction mechanisms. Actually, they're prediction mechanisms people have proposed. Uh, another aspect of this, which is really not uh, completely independent of this one, what is the interference that, you're, that this request is causing to other cores, right? That could, be a, uh, that could be an input that you take in terms of how you do the prioritization of the requests. If, for example, this request is causing uh, a lot of interference to the cores, if you schedule it, maybe you don't want to schedule it. Maybe you want other cores to go first. Right? That's the idea. And we will see this a lot in this lecture. And you're going to implement, actually, uh, in your lab, two different schedulers that try to solve this problem. One of them is going to try to solve the problem for performance, maximizing performance, and the other one is going to try to solve the problem for fairness and performance and complexity at the same time. And they're all simple schedulers. Okay, and there may be other things. You can, you can imagine other things. Does anybody have an idea what else you could put over here in the dot, dot, dot? People have imagined a lot of dot, dot, dots. I didn't put everything over here clearly, but you could imagine things also. Any thoughts? Okay, maybe you'll, you'll have more thoughts when you do the lab. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the row buffer management a little bit. This is an important aspect. It's not the only aspect, clearly, uh, but I want to talk about it before we go into more scheduling policies. There are multiple different policies to manage the row buffer. One is called open row. Basically, you access a row, and the idea is to keep the row open. Of course, the anticipation, if you, if you do this, you're implicitly anticipating that some other request will access that row, right? So if that's the case, then you got it right. Basically, you get a row hit, uh, and you did the right prediction, if you will. But if the next access in that bank is to a different row, then you get a row conflict, and you, all, you not only lose performance for that request, but also you waste energy, because you kept the row open. Keeping the row open actually consumes energy, because the row buffer is active, and the row buffer is connected to the cells, if you remember the ERM operation. It's really consuming energy all the time. And this is actually very, very important in mobile devices that look like this. Uh, okay, so that's one policy. The other policy is closed row. Uh, so I, I'll tell you the reasonable implementation of this policy. Basically, the idea is to close the row after an access. Reasonable implementation says if no other requests are already in the request buffer that need the same row. Right? Of course, you can ignore this and you can say you always close the row at access and access. But that's probably not a good idea if you already know that there's another request that wants this row, right? So normally, reasonable implementations do this. If there's, uh, if there's no other request to the same row, they close the row right after an access. Of course, this, this implicitly predicts that next access uh, goes to a different row, and it avoids a row conflict if that's the case. But if that's not the case, now, meaning that the next access actually goes to the same row, you cause an extra, extra activate latency. Right? In fact, extra pre-charge latency also, potentially. Right? That's the idea. So these are two different mechanisms, and now once you see this, you may actually think, why don't we just predict? Right? Adaptive policies do essentially that, basically. They try to predict uh, whether or not the next access to the bank will go to the same row and act accordingly. 
Clearly, if the prediction is it's going to the same row, they keep the row open. Otherwise, they close the row. And these are implemented in existing memory schedulers. Uh, although there's not a lot of literature that really talks about it. You can see some patents related to it. Um, okay. It's fascinating, isn't it? Even just the robot for management. This is important because it it's really impacts your energy significantly. And in, in many mem memory controllers, uh, what, peop uh, what, what memory controller designers do is uh, they have a timeout. If they don't actually, if the robuffer is open for too long, they basically close the robuffer so that they save energy. Of course, if you have a prediction uh, driven me mechanism, it's much better. Okay, so this is just a summary of the policies that I just described. I'm not going to go through this, basically. This, this really gives you the policy, the first access, what's the next access, and the commands needed for the next access. So for example, if, uh, if you have a closed row policy, if the first access is to row 0 and the next access uh, is to row 1, uh, yeah, you basically activate row 1, read and pre-charge uh, for the next access. You don't need to do this pre-charge, basically. So you compare these two rows, but that's okay. Okay, before we go into more scheduling, I will talk about power management a little bit because this is becoming increasingly important. Uh, DRAM chips, uh, existing DRAM chips have power modes. I don't think they're enough. I think this, this really needs to change going forward. Uh, but basically the idea is very simple. When you don't access a DRAM chip, power it down. Uh, and there are multiple different power states. Active is the highest power. Uh, Actually, there's the highest power is really when you're accessing the DRAM chip. <laughs> when you do a read or write access, which is not here, clearly that's based on access. It's not a power mode in a sense. When you're accessing it, you consume the highest power. But when you're not accessing it, the row buffer is active. That means that you're still consuming power. You need to still supply power. That's the highest power. The next, uh, this is an example set of power states. All banks are idle. This means that row buffer is really not active in any of the banks. That's another power state. Power down is in an even more, uh, even more aggressive mode where you actually cut the power to a lot of the chip. So it, it takes more time to actually power up the chip so that you can access it. I don't know where this sound is coming from. Uh, let me see. Maybe I'll reduce the... Yeah. Let's try this. And then the uh, lowest power state is self-refresh, which is what this is doing actually right now. This is uh, the memory here is in self-refresh state at this point. It's really not consuming any power other than refresh that it needs to do so that it needs to keep the memory active because it may actually receive a call or someone may interact with it so that you can actually um, you don't want to put the memory into the SSD so that you can uh, uh, you want to ma minimize the latency of data access. That's why it's in self-refresh. It could be also in hibernate mode in a sense, right? But it's not doing that. Uh, uh, also, there's some leakage power that's associated with the circuitry for refresh. But of course, these power states uh, uh, cause trade-offs. State transitions incur latency during which the chip cannot be accessed. For example, this is in self-refresh right now. I take it and I press it. And what happens is it goes out of the self-refresh mode and it goes into the memory access mode. And that takes some time. And it takes in the order of mi microseconds. Uh, because it really needs to power up a bunch of circuitry inside there. So the question, of course, is in, uh, when you're a memory controller trying to manage power, when do you go into the self-refresh mode? Should it go into the self-refresh mode right away after I do something? Or should it wait for some time, right? Yes? I'm not sure if you covered this. Uh, is it possible to go maybe even lower if memory controller knows that some, some banks are not even used mm -hmm. and then not to refresh those banks? Yeah, so absolutely, those are, those are very good points. Uh, we kind of uh, talked about it in the, in the refresh part. Existing controllers actually don't do that as much, but going forward, we'll need to do that a lot more, basically. We need to be more aggressive uh, in terms of uh, management. Basically, today, for example, there's no mechanism to turn off the banks separately. Uh, you go into re self-refresh mode, that's one. And there's no mechanism to turn off the refresh as well uh, on a per-bank basis. Exactly, yeah. Exactly. And you can see the waste, right? Yeah. It's such a waste in the end. Yeah, those ideas have been proposed, basically. For example, if, if you know that part of your memory is not allocated, why are you refreshing it today? But today, we don't have the interfaces to give that information all the way into the memory controller. I think these are simple cases where you can gain a lot in systems. That's a very good point. I don't know why this is making sounds. Jeremy, do you know? Okay, 
Any other questions? Okay. Yes? Yeah. Is um, memory usually distributed across banks? Mm -hmm. So you can't really turn off a bank because even though you use a little bit of memory, it's like distributed, so you use a little bit of each bank. That, uh, it, it, Let me, let me think of it. So it really depends on how you lay out your data in the memory. Uh, when, you, when you actually access a cache line, you're getting it out of a single bank. Next cache line, if it's in the next bank, then I think you're right. But if, if a lot of your data is just put in a single bank or two banks, then you can really turn off the other bank. So it's, uh, that's a very good point. Basically, there's an interaction between your data mapping policy and which banks you're accessing. Am I doing this or is it... Happening some, in some other way. Okay, let's try it this way. Yeah, there's something here. Okay. So basically, if you if you really want to take advantage of even lower power, you need to map your data nicely as well. Okay, it's this. I don't know why. Maybe this is a faulty one. This never happened the year before. So we're going to switch to this one. Fewer wires and less interference. Let's hope this works. Okay. Okay. Any questions? Yes, one more. If you map your data nicely, uh, don't you miss out on some advantage of distributing it? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, it's a trade-off in the end, right? If you map your data nicely, maybe you lose some bank parallelism because you're, you're, you're keeping your data only in one bank. Right? I imagine you can have multiple robot hits because you use more banks. Exactly, exa exactly. So it really depends on what, you, what your access patterns are also like. This kind of goes back to my example from Zurich Airport, if you remember, right? The train divided into half. Uh, your data is mapped into one, one channel only. You're not utilizing the other channel. Right? <laughs> you could keep that idle. You could power it down somehow. Although that's not done at the Zurich Airport, clearly. It's really wasted. <laughs> but that's, that's the example. Okay. Any other thoughts? You're, you're hitting some fundamental points, basically. These are really things that need to be uh, handled better. But there's not enough research, I think, in these areas. Okay, so let's talk about difficulty of DRAM control a little bit more before we go into uh, some human design scheduling policies. So let me go into a little bit more uh, detail. Basically, why are these DRAM controls difficult to design? Uh, and actually, uh, these, are, these are actually really difficult to design components. Uh, I don't remember if we discussed this. Uh, have, you, have you heard about self-optimizing memory controllers before? Okay, good. Good, so we're going to discuss it. Uh, I talked about it briefly in my earlier lectures, but I don't think anybody has taken those lectures, digital circuits. Like who, who was in digital circuits before? Okay, no one here. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so uh, uh, let me go through this, and then I'll give you the story. Basically, there are many DRAM constraints. Uh, actually, 50 is an understatement. Uh, there are more than 100 DRAM timing constraints in DRAM. For example, there's a constraint that says write to read latency. The minimum number of cycles to wait before issuing a read command after a write command is issued. And this is at the rank level, basically. Uh, if you're assuming uh, one, rank is, uh, one channel is one rank, basically you can only do a read or write to the rank. You cannot do reads and writes simultaneously. That's what this says. And if you want to switch from write mode to read mode, you need to wait for some time. The, uh, the, the same is true for read, to write to read mode to write mode. So this clearly now imposes a very not so nice constraint. You have to treat reads and writes differently fundamentally. So why is this constraint there? This constraint is there because whenever you're driving the memory bus, you drive it only one way. You could potentially make it dri driven both ways, but that becomes more complicated electrically. So it's only one way. You need to turn around the bus if you actually want to drive it uh, the other way. Basically, when you're writing, you write the data into the DRAM chip. When you're reading, you read the data out of the DRAM chip. So that's one way. So you need to turn it around. And that takes, this is called the bus turnaround time. And this is the timing constraint that takes into account the bus turnaround time. It could be on the order of nanoseconds. We will see. Uh, so what, the, what do existing memory controllers do? They try to actually batch the write requests. 
what they do is they accumulate the write request in a write buffer and they wait for some time before they start servicing those write requests. And if that write buffer is almost full or af uh, after a high water mark, they say, okay, it's time to switch to the write mode. And when they switch to the write mode, you cannot service reads from that channel. That sounds bad, right? Because reads are critical for performance. Writes are not critical for performance unless they get in the way of reads. Which, and in this case, they may be getting in the way of reads, right? So the question is, when do you switch between writes, uh, write modes and read mode? It turns out this has a huge effect on performance. As we will, I will give you some reference to the papers. So you need to do it carefully. Uh, and this is something we have not even considered so far, right? And there are a bunch of other things. TRC, you've already seen. This is the minimum of, number of cycles between the issuing of two consecutive activate commands to the same bank. This is really what DRAM, uh, DRAM is thought of in terms of latency. This is really the DRAM latency. Back to act, act, activate latency to the same bank. And there are a bunch of other ones. I, we, I will show you some more. Okay, this is timing constraints. You need to keep track of many resources to prevent conflicts. Channels, banks, ranks, data bus, address bus, row buffers. Uh, Clearly, you should ensure that no two banks load data to the data bus at the same time, right? That should not happen. Uh, you need to handle DRAM refresh on top of this. Today it's simple, but it's not as simple also. The, even DRAM refresh has some flexibility. Even though every row needs to be refreshed every 64 milliseconds, well, today every 32 milliseconds, still you have some flexibility in terms of when you can schedule those refreshes. So you can pull in some refreshes early, you can pull out some refreshes late. And that actually gives you some flexibility in terms of handling the schedule of requests. We will not go into a lot of detail. I'll point to some papers over here. But this is important for correctness as well as performance. You need to manage power consumption. And you need to optimize for performance and quality of service in the presence of all of these constraints. And it turns out reordering is not simple. We talked about reordering. But it's not very simple, especially if you have very large buffer sizes. And on top of this, if you start to thinking about fairness and quality of service to different cores, different agents that are accessing memory, that complicates the scheduling problem. So there are many, many things to think about. So these are some examples. This is actually the paper that talks about write to read scheduling. It's one of the first papers in the uh, area that goes into a lot of detail. But uh, let me give you, this is the, uh, where is the read to, this is the write to read latency, for example. It's six cycles, six DRAM cycles. That's a lot of cycles that are wasted. Uh, and these are a bunch of, uh, some, some of the constraints. If you're really interested, uh, these two papers that, some of which you've read, actually cover uh, these constraints. Uh, so why do we have all of these timing constraints? This sounds like a mess, right, actually, if you, if you go into this one. Uh, you, you've already seen some of these timing constraints in the last lecture. That's why I'm not going to, into a lot of detail. But if you, let's, uh, let's look at one of them. So this is a bank in pre charged state. Uh, you activate it, you send an activate command, and uh, before you read uh, or write to it, you need to wait for some time. You need to wait for some time so that uh, the data uh, gets ready to read in the sense amplifiers, right? That's the reason. So there are really physical reasons for these timing constraints. And clearly people have specified different timing constraints for different physical operation uh, phenomena uh, in DRAM. So this is TRCD, that's activate latency. You can see that this activate to read write. Its scope is bank level and its value is 13 to 15 nanoseconds in DDR3, for example. There, there's something else. Uh, this is, let's, let's pick another one. Yeah, this is read to write, for example. Uh, basically, th this is the, uh, it dictates the timing distance from a read command to a write command, and it's enforced at the rank level, and you can see that its value is 11 to 15 nanoseconds. And there's a reason for it also, you need to turn around the bus from read to write. So clearly you have many, many of these reasons. This sounds like a mess, right? Basically people have specified individual timing constraints for every single combination of first command and the next command. Why did they do that? <laughs> Why didn't they say, okay, I access the app and I have only a single timing constraint. It takes X cycles. And then I'll wait for X cycles and I can do anything I want to the DRAM afterwards. Exactly. Basically, if you do what I just said, X needs to be the worst case of all uh, combination of first command and the next command, right? Which means that that X will be very large, which means that you cannot optimize the latency as much. You can see that the difference over here, this is 50, for example, and this is 7.5. 
Now you know the commands, the difference. If it's an activate to activate, you wait for 50. If it's read to pre-charge, you wait for only 7.5. And that, gives, that reduces the latency, as opposed to having a single timing constraint for DM. That's why we have all these timing constraints. But of course, there's another question you can ask. Why do I have to deal with all of this mess? Why don't, have, uh, why don't I just send the command to DM and wait for an acknowledgement for my request? Right. If it's like traffic on the bus and then mm -hmm. Basically, you need to wait for an acknowledgement, yes. You, there's a handshake protocol that you need to go through. You're right. Although I'm not sure if the answer is there, that's very, uh, as, as simple as that. I think we need to really re-examine this. Age. So basically, if you think about this, it's a very synchronous uh, way of... This is, that's why existing DRAMs are synchronous DRAMs. They're called synchronous DRAMs. It's a very synchronous way of communication. The memory control exactly knows, based on some specification, how long it needs to wait between two different things that it can do. And it's, uh, it's very well synchronized. Uh, it's, it's an interface that uh, is dictated by the data sheets. And the memory controller is designed for that. Uh, and everything is dictated that way. So the memory controller takes into account all these parameters. But there's a completely different way of designing memory and memory controllers, which is asynchronous. And the idea is, you get rid of all of these. The interface is very simple. The memory controller sends a command, or let's say a high-level command, read, write, request. And the memory responds when it's ready. Right. The memory controller has no idea how long something will take. It'll take as long as it takes, and the when uh, it'll be done, it'll assume that the command is done when the memory responds. Right. That's the idea. Yes? So the point is that if you want to take advantage of this variance between the latencies, somebody mm -hmm. has to deal with this complexity anyway. Right? Exactly. So maybe, maybe there's an internal memory control on the DRAM side that deals with that. Yeah, but if yes. complexity is put in the DRAM, that's a very good. Now, now you're asking the right questions. That's good. Do you put it inside the DM or do you put it inside a logic layer very close to the DM? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, the, hold that thought a little bit because so there's also some evolution over here, which is really interesting. The memory controller has been the domain of something outside the DM for a long time. It's logic, right? The logic is doing all of this scheduling. So maybe synchronous DM, if you actually have all of these latencies, you can do the reordering very, very nicely. And then the memory is something kind of dumb. But if the memory is not fully dumb, if it has some logic inside it or underneath it, then maybe this other controller that's on the processor side can be much simpler, right? So your point is completely correct. Somebody needs to do this reordering if you want to maximize performance. The question is who needs to do it? Yes? Yeah, I think I think you two have similar points actually. Basically, you can schedule smarter because you know all of this. But the question is, who should know all of that, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, but keep these things in mind. I think uh, I think thinking about asynchronous DRAMs may be a good idea uh, going forward. But you're pushing the complexity somewhere else potentially if you ma if you're making the interface as asynchronous. But if if that complexity can be implemented inside a DRAM chip or inside a DRAM stack, maybe that's the right thing to do, right? That, inter that interface could be good for processing inside the memory also, because now, you know, now your interface doesn't need to be uh, command-based. It, it can be packet-based, right? You can send a packet to memory, and when the memory decodes that packet, it figures out, oh, I have a function to execute, right? And that function may really consist of multiple different commands as well, right? Oh, okay, yes? So, um, so why is it so bad to have this, uh, like, in this interface that we're talking about yeah. now? Why do, we, why do we really want to make it asynchronous? Why do I want to just sit in there on chip uh -huh. as like a memory controller and just throw something at the memory and just wait for it to complete? Yeah. Like it's not that bad that... I mean, because we know that there, there is somebody that anyways has to handle this, it doesn't really, I would say it doesn't really matter because at the end I have to wait for this complexity mm -hmm. to... Uh, actually calculate something and I have to wait for it. So it depends on who has more information, I think, right? So today, because you cannot communicate uh, a lot of information, you may actually not have a lot of 
uh, benefit from this reorg. I mean, you will have. Uh, I'm not saying this is completely bad, right? Yeah. This is something to be rethought of. Yeah. This interface has been assumed for a long time. It has not been like this. In the past, it was asynchronous. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. Today, it's time to potentially rethink because the complexity is getting out of hand. And we, ha we actually have new technologies where you can have memory controllers on the other side, close to the app. Yes, I'll take one more. In. So it's just, it could be exactly the same mechanism, right? So today, somebody guarantees that these operations complete. Internally, the memory also can have internal timings, right? But also, it could, it could decide, uh, it could do all of the optimizations that we talked about in terms of adaptive latency internally, right? as opposed to having something else that's outside the memory trying to figure that out. Maybe some additional hardware is needed here. Exactly, exactly. Okay, Okay. so now, now you know why you have all these different types of timing constraints, because it enables you to optimize performance, but also keep in mind that this may not be the best way of designing going forward. Okay, and there are a bunch of papers that also talk about the reasons, but you've seen this also. And keep in mind that this, uh, the memory controller design is actually becoming more difficult. If you look uh, into a system, a system is not just CPUs, it's also GPUs, hardware accelerators, I.O. devices. This has lots of accelerators in it. Machine learning accelerators, they all go through the memory controller, basically. And memory is also becoming complicated. We have hybrid memories. So I have heterogeneous agents, heterogeneous memories. And you need to design a memory controller, multiple memory controllers, that try to reduce the interference between these agents and try to satisfy all of the constraints of different memories. And you have many, many goals at the same time. Performance, fairness, quality of service, energy efficiency, dot, dot, dot. Right. We're going to focus on just performance for now, actually, for the rest of this part of the lecture. Even performance itself not, is not easy, actually, assuming you want to do, uh, get the highest performance as well as uh, or obey all the constraints, right? Because you need to obey the constraints to make sure things work. I'll give you the story that I wanted to give you earlier, but uh, does anybody know the name Chuck Packer here? No one? No one old enough? You haven't? Has anybody heard about the, uh, the Xerox Alto system, for example? These are the early personal computers in 1960s, late 1960s. Chuck Packer was a key designer, system architect of the Xerox Alto system. It's an early PC. He, he won the Turing Award in 2009. Uh, and he... Uh, because of the system design he did. Basically, he is an extremely good designer. And I got to know him while I was at Microsoft Research because he was also at Microsoft Research. And at the time, I was working on memory controllers at, uh, at the architectural level. He was also designing memory controllers for the FPGA engines that he was very interested in at that time. And these were DDR3 memory controllers. I would call them simpler than some other memory controllers. And uh, this designer, who has designed the early personal computers, that a lot of system level work, he said that this memory controller is the worst thing I've designed in my life. <laughs> basically, he, he took a lot of pains to design that memory controller because of everything we discussed, basically. <laughs> so he thought it's a mess. And think about this coming from a, essentially a Turing Award winner who has designed many early systems. Right? And those early systems are not all so simple because you need to really make sure that personal computer works. You need to do the earliest virtual memory mechanisms if you think about it, right? They're not simple things. But, then, but apparently, according to him, they were not as messy as a memory controller. <laughs> so that's, that gives you a perspective in terms of what a memory controller is like. And I agree with that, actually. I think a memory controller is a terrible thing to design today. As a result, we end up with very simple policies. So because of that, uh, we were at the same time thinking of this. So the reality, uh, and this is obvious, I think, if you've ever designed a memory controller, it'll hit you right away. It's basically difficult. It's difficult to design a policy that maximizes performance, even ignoring quality of service and energy efficiency. Let's st stop at performance. If you put other things on top of it, it becomes even worse. So basically, there are too many things to think about. I've given you a bunch of these things. And I think it's not humanly possible to design the best policy if you want to do this. And we, uh, especially if you want to adapt to continuously changing workloads and system behavior, right? Because imagine you're designing this memory controller, and that memory controller is going to execute workload X now, but later it's going to execute workload Y, and sometimes it's going to work execute combination, right? How do you design a policy that fits all of them, right? So as a result, what you end up with is 
Very simple policies. This memory controller is doing first ready, first come, first serve, a variant of it, since the beginning of its life. And it hasn't learned anything, basically. It's as dumb as whatever you see as dumb, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's very bad, basically. It's, I don't know how it's operating. I think it's operating for five years. Maybe I have it for five years or so. And it's still doing the same policy. So it's good to question, does it really make sense to design a system that is like this today, in 2019? So keep that in mind. So that was our dream, basically. Wouldn't it be nice if the memory controller uh, actually found a good scheduling policy of its, on its own, as opposed to a human dictating the policy? Because I don't think this is really humanly possible. This is a place where uh, we really need to realize humans' boundaries, probably. Okay, so basically we, want to just, we wanted to just look at the performance function of the memory controller. You have a memory controller. It uh, resolves memory contention by scheduling the requests. The key question is, how do we schedule these requests to maximize system performance? Right. And this was our idea. We called the self-optimizing DRAM controls. We did this work in 2007 or, or so. And I've already given you the problem, basically. DRAM controls are difficult to design. It's difficult for human designers to come up with a policy that can adapt itself very well to many workloads and different system conditions. Uh, even within the same workload, actually. <laughs> you don't even need to think about different workloads. Even within the same workload, it's using the exact same policy over time. Right? So our idea was to have a memory control that adapts its scheduling policy to workload behavior and system conditions using machine learning. And the observation we had, I think, was nice. Uh, basically, we saw that reinforcement learning maps very nicely to memory control. Reinforcement learning is a very basic learning mechanism. Actually, all of us are re reinforcement learning agents right now. That's, uh, we'll talk about that also. Uh, but basically, uh, our design was to have a mem design a memory control as a reinforcement learning agent. Uh, and what does this agent do? It dynamically and continuously learns and employs the best scheduling policy to maximize long-term performance. Of course, there's a lot that needs to go into it, which we will briefly talk about. I'm not going to go into detail, but I will uh, have, the pa have you read the paper for your next homework. So what's a reinforcement learning agent? As, as I said, all of us are reinforcement learning agents. Uh, actually, all living beings are reinforcement learning agents. You're basically an agent that interacts with the environment. You observe some state in the environment, and you take, an, you take some action, and you get some reward. And over time, assuming that you want to maximize that reward, you try to choose the actions that maximize the reward at a given state. Right? That's the idea. It's very simple. Right? It's actually a lot of fundamentals of uh, behavioral psychology is based on this. Right? If you know the name uh, B.F. Skinner, he is really the father of uh, reinforcement learning in psychology or behaviorism. Basically, he showed that uh, you could educate the mice. Right? The mice you put in a box, uh, the, a mouse you put in a box, and uh, the mouse somehow, uh, there's a lever, uh, the mouse somehow randomly figures out that when it presses the lever, it gets food. So it gets reinforced. Right? So it takes an action in a given state, and it gets a reward. And it, it figures out, it makes a connection between pressing the lever and getting the reward, and it keeps doing that to maximize its reward, right? That's positive reinforcement. There's also negative reinforcement. You don't get a reward, you get a punishment, right? If you do something that doesn't really... Uh, if you wander around, for example, as a mouse, maybe you get uh, electroshocked. He, did, he had this box, actually. It's called the Skinner box, if you're interested in looking at it. So it's basically reinforcement learning. People, uh, people and animals uh, have this principle, right? If you, it's a hot stove, right? You have, you have your hand, you put it on a hot stove, you get negative reinforcement, right? <laughs> you get a punishment, negative reward, basically. So uh, memory controls actually map nicely to this also. Uh, actually, um, you can model this action as a Markov decision process. And uh, reinforcement learning, in terms of statistics, uh, people have shown that uh, reinforcement learning best if, uh, works best if, if, if the uh, if the state and the environment can be expressed as a Markov, if the state space can be expressed as a Markov decision process, you basically in this state, and with some probability, uh, if you take some action with some probability, you go to some other state. Right? That's a Markov decision process, and you can prove a lot of things about reinforcement learning if you have a system that obeys this Markov decision process principle. I'm not going to go into the details. That's more theoretical aspects of machine learning, clearly. But the paper. Uh, uh, show, uh, points you to enough references talking about this. It turns out memory scheduler, if you constrain the problem to uh, performance, 
and performance, specifically data bus utilization, it's really a Markov decision process. Basically, a scheduler uh, observes some state uh, and it takes an action, schedules a command, and that action leads to some reward. And reward can be expressed in terms of data bus utilization. Is it utilized or not? And over time, it records this information. It figures out which state, uh, uh, which action at a given state leads to the maximum data bus utilization over time. Okay? That's the idea. Of course, the goal is not to immediately maximize data bus utilization. The goal is to maximize long-term data bus utilization. So this reward function is really important. So specification of that reward function, how do you update the rewards that you get is really important. I'm not going to go into the detail, but there's uh, basically you get some reward at time zero, at time one, at time two, at time three, at time dot, dot, dot. You kind of weight them somehow uh, with some weighting function. This is one simple weighting function. So you learn to maximize longer term rewards for a given state action pair, let's say. That's the idea. Of course, for this, you need to have some tables that record your state and that record, uh, that record the correlation between the state action pairs and the learned rewards. And then the next time you're in, that, uh, in, a, in a similar state, let's say, because you want to generalize also, you don't want to be extremely specific. Generalization is very important, actually, for learning in general. You don't want to, uh, you don't want to observe exactly the same conditions, right, uh, to take the action that maximizes your reward. You want to really try to generalize to similar conditions. And how do you do that is very, very interesting also in reinforcement learning. But basically, if you observe a similar state, you know now, okay, you have all these choice of actions, and they all lead to different reward values. You pick the action that maximizes your reward in the long term. That's the idea. That's assuming you've learned all of this in your tables nicely. Right? Okay. So basically, that's the idea. The paper has more detail, and I'll refer you to the paper. You associate system states uh, and actions with long-term reward values. Each action at a given state learn leads to a learned reward. Uh, and you schedule the command with highest estimated long-term reward value in each state, at a given state. And you continuously update the reward values for the state action pairs based on feedback from the system. Clearly, you see what rewards you've gotten uh, in the end cycles since you scheduled this command at that given state, at that given state action pair, basically. Okay? So clearly this is more complicated than FRFCFS. Right? It's going to cost you something. But it's also give, going to give you benefit. So uh, the paper describes uh, a bunch of stuff, and you can read it. Basically, states come from the state of the system. Actions are actions taken by the scheduler. Actions are easier to define, clearly. Rewards is very important. This reward function you need to be very careful about. All, all states are also very important, actually. Uh, I think actions are the easiest part over here because you know what kind of actions are available uh, to you as a memory scheduler. You need to figure out which state uh, uh, attributes you, you observe. Because if you actually look at all of the state attributes, there could be millions, clearly, right, in a system, that increases your table size. is huge. And that reduces your learning, rate, uh, learning uh, uh, speed as well. Uh, and reward is very important because if you don't specify the reward function correctly, then you may be actually optimizing for something that you don't want. Let's take a look at what we did, basically. We wanted to maximize data bus utilization, so our reward function was very simple. Uh, we got a plus one reward for scheduling read and write commands and zero reward for all other actions, all other commands. Clearly, this, is, this makes sense, right? Of course, there's also an update function for the reward, which I showed you with the, with the gammas and Rs. That update function is also important. State attributes, this, is, this I think can be automated actually. There's a lot of work in machine learning today that tries to automate the discovery of which state attributes should you look at. We didn't do that. We did it statically. Basically, we had this list of more than 400 different types of state attributes that you can look at in a system. And with a lot of simulation of uh, a reinforcement learning scheduler, we tried to uh, reduce the number of attributes we look at to six or so. In the end, we reduced to six, I think. If you count these, it's six. But basically, these turned out to be the most important state attributes. Now, this is where the human design needs to do a lot of work. They need to specify the reward function. That's a lot of work. They need to figure out which state attributes are good to look at for the machine learning agent. This is a lot of work also. Clearly, you start with some intuition, and you try, you try to narrow the state space. Right? Number of reads, number of writes, these turned out to be important. Number of load misses in the transaction queue, this is the memory scheduling buffers, that turned out to be important also. Clearly, this kind of makes sense, right? Because you want to know how many reads or how many writes you have 
that has some impact on uh, your scheduling decision. Okay. Number of pending writes, uh, that's also important. Number of reorder buffer heads waiting for the reference row. It, to it turns out to be this also important. What does this mean? Reorder buffer heads mean, mean the oldest instructions in each core that are waiting for the reference row. That means that that row is really important at this point, right? Because there's some instruction that's waiting for that row that's delaying, blocking the progress of the processor. So clearly, you somehow need to think about these states, uh, potential state attributes, uh, to uh, feed into your mechanism to find out what state attributes you're eventually going to use. Request relative reorder buffer order. This also has some impact on criticality of the request, right? Where is it? Do you have a 128 entry instruction window or reorder buffer. Is it at the top or is it at the bottom? It's at the top meaning, means that it's the oldest. It's at the bottom means that it's the youngest. If it's at the bottom, maybe it's not as important, right? Of course, we don't know this because this is in the end, machine learning is learning some state action pairs uh, and reward values based on these states, but we can guess why, it's select, uh, why our state feature selection mechanism actually selected these. So basically, uh, this is, these are the six attributes. I think it's six in the end. Six attributes that, uh, after feature selection, uh, uh, our 400 plus attributes were narrowed down to. Okay, actions, as I said, actions are relatively simple. Clearly, you have some actions to do. Uh, we distinguish between loads and store, load and store misses over here. This is, you, you still have some freedom over here, right? Because uh, you may want to distinguish between a read that's because of a load miss and read that's because of a load miss, a store miss. And that's, we, we, we said that these are actually different actions. They're really not different actions from the memory controller's perspective, but they're really, uh, they're different actions from a learning perspective, potentially, because you may want to actually learn uh, different rewards for this, right? And it turned out that this was actually important. There's also an op, as you can see over here. And precharge, we, we actually uh, did two different kinds of precharges. Precharge uh, pending, when there's really a precharge that's needed, and a preemptive precharge. Meaning, you don't, uh, there's no command that requires a precharge, but you may want to precharge the row, right? But you need to actually incorporate this action because uh, if you don't have that, you, you will never preemptively precharge, right? The, the learning agent will never learn to issue a precharge. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, let's take a look at some results, I guess. You're waiting for the results. So basically, the results are good. <laughs> Let me put it that way. You can read the paper. But uh, it, this leads to large, robust performance improvements over many human design policies. And we actually tried to use exactly the same information and automate the exploration of hum possibly human design uh, policy space. And we found out that we cannot beat this scheduler. I think. Uh, for example, if you look over here, with these workloads, it gets about 19% performance improvement. And the maximum that you can get the optimistic scheduler is really 70%. That's the ideal scheduler. Uh, and I believe this, these results can actually change depending on the intensity of the workloads. I don't believe that these were the most intensive workloads that we, we examined. But if you actually, uh, this is FRFCFS. It, it's the baseline. So you get 19%. If you try to optimize FRFCFS very heavily and go through a state space exploration, do the reordering as much as possible between using the same attributes that we found out over here, it turns out you get about 5% more on top of FRFCFS. So there's benefits from online learning that's coming. We also looked at online versus offline versions of this. Uh, clearly this is an online policy, right? It changes the scheduling policy online. But you could also imagine designing an offline uh, machine learning based memory controller. You found out an offline scheduling policy and then you bake it into hardware. You never learn over time. It turns out that's better than existing systems, but it's not as good as doing online learning. So clearly there's some benefit that comes from online learning. You adapt to the conditions of the system and the workload. And there's a lot more detail in the paper. Yes? What exactly is the optimistic here? Is like theoretical maximum? Yeah, uh, it's not. Uh, yeah, you could think of it as a theoretical maximum in the sense that basically we got rid of all the scheduling constraints except the data bus conflicts. There's no timing constraint other than data bus timing constraints. So it's, it's an unachievable maximum. You could actually bound it lower, but we wanted to look at that. But I don't think any scheduler can achieve that, actually. Any other questions? Okay, you'll have fun reading this paper. Is it interesting? Okay, cool. I think there needs to be a lot more, as we will discuss in a little bit. So let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of this. Uh, so I, in my opinion, there are two major advantages. Basically, this provides you continuous learning in the presence of changing environment. Uh, 
that gets rid of this stupid scheduler, let's say, right? The scheduler is basically doing the same thing for five years. It hasn't learned a thing from what it has seen. It's seen a lot. It's seen a lot of instructions, a lot of memory requests, and has learned nothing, right? So, but, but this one is very different, right? It learns. Uh, of course, it comes at a hardware cost. The paper analyzed the hardware cost. You need a 32 kilobyte uh, buffer inside there. I believe it's implementable, uh, so it's not that bad. Actually, people have worked on reinforcement learning in hardware in the, as early as 1970s. Uh, we, we borrowed some of their implementation. Uh, it's called CMAC. I don't remember uh, what CMAC stood for, but uh, it's cellular something array computer. Uh, Anyway, you can look at it in the paper. So basically, the hardware implementation is also not bad, although that's going to be a negative over here. So it also reduces the designer burden in finding a good scheduling policy, because now the designer uh, has a higher level function, if you will. The designer doesn't dictate what the policy is. Uh, the designer figures out what system variables might be useful, and it inputs that to a feature selection process. And the designer uh, provides what target to optimize, but he or she doesn't say how to optimize it. Basically, how to optimize is completely up to the machine learning agent. It's automatic. I think that reduces the designer burden significantly in general. And if you look at these controllers, that's where the burden really is. Of course, there are downsides now, right? How do you specify different objectives? I think our objective was actually very simple, data bus utilization, but that's not the only objective that you have in real systems. Clearly, there's fairness, there's quality of service, there's uh, predictable performance requirements that you have sometimes. Those all need to be incorporated into the memory scheduler. And we're going to talk about those, but not from a machine learning perspective later on. Hardware complexity, I think this is an issue. Uh, clearly, this is more complex, but you, get, uh, you need to pay something to get something. And nothing is free, as you know already. Uh, I think this can be managed. And I think there needs to be more research in terms of how to actually make this less complex in general. And maybe there needs to be other algorithms to explore, right? Reinforcement learning is great, I think, but there may be other algorithms that, can, that you can take advantage of uh, today. And I think maybe the, one of the hardest part is design mindset and flow. So clearly this goes against uh, the design flow that you have in existing systems, right? You have a design flow that basically says policy is specified. All of your testing today assumes that your policy is specified, right? How do you test something like this? Because you don't know what results that you're expecting, right? Whenever you, whenever you do a test, a hardware test today, you give some inputs, you know exactly what the output should be. Here you don't know. No idea, actually. In fact, we incorporate randomness into the scheduling policy. Because remember, uh, remember the mouse that I talked about? Mouse, actually, uh, Skinner's mouse randomly figures out to press the lever. So initially, you need to do some random exploration. Uh, in, in, in machine learning, there's always a trade-off between exploration and exploitation. Right? You have some policy, you learned it, you exploit it. But if you keep exploiting that policy, you don't learn new things. So you, you really need to have provisions for exploration as well. And that's where randomness comes in. Uh, the way we incorporated exploration into this policy is basically, once in a while, with very small probability, uh, we don't follow what we just described. We don't basically pick the action that gives you the highest reward. We pick a random action. And that random action enables you to explore different, uh, different spaces uh, in your... Uh, 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 in your state action pair and reward functions, basically, in that mapping. And that's really critical, basically. And once you incorporate that sort of randomness, even if you don't incorporate that sort of randomness, you don't know what the output will be. So it's very, uh, th this design mindset also needs to change. Because you really design the controller in a very different way. And perhaps this is the hardest part, as we will, we've also talked about in mindset right earlier. OK, so I'm going to assign this for you. Hopefully, you'll have fun reading it. Uh, has anybody studied machine learning here before? Okay, that's, have, you, have you studied reinforcement learning? No? Okay. So if you're actually interested in studying reinforcement learning, uh, Richard Sutton, who is, who is really uh, the person who's de developed a lot of the initial reinforcement learning algorithm, has a book on it. I think it's called Reinforcement Learning. I don't, I don't think it has a longer name, but maybe it does. And it's also free online. If you go to his webpage, you get a PDF. And he's updated recently. I studied that book a long time ago, which was not updated in 2018, clearly. But it's now, it's now up to date. You can, you can look at a lot of reinforcement learning over there. And uh, nicely so, he actually uses this as, as one of the successful applications of reinforcement learning in recent years. <laughs> it's not that recent, as you can see. It's 
30, 12 years or so uh, since we did this work. But I think there needs to be a lot more work uh, in this area going forward. So let me uh, pull back a little bit. I think uh, this is really thinking about architecture as a self-optimizing manner. And memory controller, even though it's a very good place to think about it this way, I think there are a lot of other controllers that we need to think about. And I also call this data-driven, right? Clearly what we've done is uh, it's self-optimizing over time. It's also data-driven. It's looking at the data. It's, it's trying to make sense out of the data and uh, form a policy out of that data that it sees. In this case, data are all of the addresses, all of the uh, commands that it schedules, and it's learning from that data. And I think we need to do more of this. So if you look at system architecture design today, uh, we have mostly human-driven uh, design. Humans do everything, basically. Uh, including the testing, actually, most of the testing. Uh, but uh, we're not talking about testing here. Humans design the policies. They basically dictate how to do the things. In the end, the machine is going to execute them, but really humans are designing them. Maybe that's not the right way going forward. Uh, as a result of this, because humans are not capable of uh, dealing with very complicated state spaces, you get very simple, short-sighted policies all over the system. And you cannot blame the humans for this, I think. I think we're all very capable for many things, but maybe not necessarily dealing with huge amounts of states. Uh, and you can see that in me uh, memory controllers, right? First, first ready, first come, first serve is clearly very simple. Deciding which row buffer, whether to keep the row buffer open or closed, even with prediction mechanisms, is still very simple. Because you design the prediction mechanism, and the prediction mechanism is fixed. Right? But, it, but if it was machine learning based, it would be different. Right? Uh, there's no automatic data-driven policy learning as a result of this. Actually, the hardware design it has no machine learning in it, as far as I know. There are some exceptions to it, which we will talk about. Uh, some branch predictors in some systems employ perceptrons, which are a very limited form of machine learning. It's a single-layer network, basically. That's it. And some, some branch predictors actually do that, and that's a very good step in the right direction. But that's very simple also. Uh, but there, no other controller has automatic data-driven policy learning. In fact, there's almost no learning. You cannot take lessons from past actions as we discussed. So the key question is, can we really design fundamentally intelligent architectures? And I think fundamentally intelligent architectures mean that you really need to design architectures that are more self-optimizing. So what is that? I think it needs to be data-driven as opposed to human-driven. Machine learns the best policies and how to do things. It doesn't, be, it doesn't get dictated by the humans. And this hopefully leads to sophisticated, workload-driven, changing, far-sighted policies. Basically, over the lifetime of five years, you learn a lot, and you adapt, and you become better and better and better and better. Just like humans do, right? Hopefully we learn from our past actions and we become better. Now, I don't know if that, that's evidence. Clearly, politicians don't learn from past actions, so they make life worse and worse in the world. But <laughs> that, that may not be true for uh, average humans. I think average humans learn quite a bit. Okay, uh, and uh, this leads to automatic data-driven policy learning, right? And hopefully, in the end, the all controllers are intelligent data-driven agents, right? So they can, they have some autonomy, if you will. So I think given this, we really need to rethink the design of all controllers, especially if you really want to design more intelligent architectures. And actually, uh, I think there are three really princi uh, different principles. I gave a talk recently, and I promised you that we're going to talk about th all of these three. We already talked about this data-centric principle, which is really in-memory computation, for example. That was an example. Actually, low-latency architectures are really data-centric. If you really want to be data-centric, you really want to treat the data uh, in the best way, and you really want to reduce the latency and energy of that data. That's, that's the data-centric. Now I'm giving you the data-driven principle, right? This is really, you design the system such that it's data-driven as opposed to human-driven, and now you understand what this means, hopefully. We're going to talk about that later also. But basically, this, this says that we need to understand what data we're dealing with, and we need to adapt the policies to the different types of data that we're dealing with. But we're going to talk about that. And I think uh, all of these really <laughs> resemble something like this more, in my opinion. But I think you really need to think across the stack. I think what I've shown you here is really machine learning and uh, uh, architecture interaction, if you will. I don't know where to place machine learning over here. But you really can cut across some of the parts of the stack over here, especially if you want to incorporate quality of service here. OK, so this is where I want to stop. Any questions? So we're going to pick up after some number of minutes.